I think it's a natural question is, uh, why explore space? And some people have, uh, different people have different views on this. Personally, to my way of thinking, uh, part of human nature is to reach out and explore. The fact of the matter is, if man stops really stretching himself and extending himself and looking, looking out, then I think that's when civilization will begin to decline. Uh, man just has that inquisitive nature, and it's got to be satisfied. Uh, we're uh, right on the threshold of uh, really a brand new opportunity uh, to explore the uh, solar system and the universe and to increase the value of benefits back here on home. Our space lab itself, as it uh, is presently conceived, will provide us with a, a capability which grows on Skylab, expands on Skylab, and provides us with an enormous capability to conduct research in space. And of course, space exploration provides this, uh, this spiritual quality. It allows you to, uh, to f go to the unknown and find what's there, and uh, hopefully by doing so, you're going to improve your lot. To have a guy there to change film, to change programs, to repoint the thing, to fix it when it breaks, to take it out and put a new one in, uh, is in many cases not only uh, the, the rewarding thing to do, but it's the cheap thing to do. First, uh, we've explored the moon, and we've now gone to explore near space, and finally uh, we're going to explore the solar system. All of this, uh, man plays an integral part. If our children and our children's children are going to enjoy the same quality of life here on Earth as we have enjoyed in the past, we're going to have to learn how to find new resources and how to manage the ones that we have more efficiently and more effectively. Of course, Apollo went on to uh, take us to the moon, but it also left us with a tremendous technology to look towards the future. And as far as Skylab is concerned, it represents a definite turning point. May 14th, 1973, a working laboratory, man's first home in space, on its way to Earth orbit, there to be occupied by three teams of astronauts in three record-breaking missions. Over the next several months, a lot of theory would become fact and give rise to new theory about man, about Earth, about the physical universe. But on this day, a sequence of events began to cast doubt on even a first mission. Of course, as soon as we could listen in on the flight director net, we realized something had happened to the lab, even though it looked like a perfect launch from where we had been observing it. The meteoroid shield ripped off about 60 seconds into the flight, and with the meteoroid shield gone, this gave us the problem of overheating and the workshop, so many different ideas in the intervening 10 days were put out as different means of being able to rig a temporary heat shield or a permanent heat shield which would allow us to salvage the vehicle. Of course, all the NASA centers were working on it, all our contractors were working on it, and taking an active part in the discussions and the decisions that were made as to what's wrong with the workshop and how we're going to fix it. We went to Marshall to work in the water tank with the proposed fixes, talk to the engineers who were working on it, talk to the flight planners, and discuss it, of course, with management. And uh, we actually launched on the 25th of May with three potential ways of covering the workshop to shade it from the sun. About seven and a half hours after liftoff, as we were rendezvousing with the workshop, the extent of the damage became apparent to us very rapidly. We first confirmed that the one solar wing had completely left the vehicle and was no longer around. We could see the 
damaged wires at the hinge line. And, and of course, all the gold foil, uh, which normally would have been underneath the heat shield and meteoroid shield, was uh, exposed to the sunlight. And it had darkened on the sun side considerably. Then as we got around to the side where the jammed solar wing was, it became immediately obvious to us that this little tiny metal strap that had torn off the heat shield and meteoroid shield had jammed the solar wing. Well, the advantages which manned spaceflight offers are in the area of repair and maintenance, which we've demonstrated uh, time and time again on Skylab. As a matter of fact, the whole Skylab series of flights would have been a failure had it not been for the ability of the first crew to repair the space station. Okay, Pete, yeah, we had a little drop out Pete and I went down into the workshop, installed the canister that contained the parasol in the scientific airlock. Joe was observing the deployment of the parasol from the command module. Roger, copy. Okay, we had no trouble I couldn't see the airlock itself, but... Uh, I could see this funny-looking orange thing, all rolled up and skinny, come uh, come pooching out of there. And then Pete said, okay, we're going to let her go. And it just started to unfold and did a lot of flapping, and it kind of settled halfway folded and halfway unfolded. We deployed it as best we could, uh, pulled it back down to us about a foot off, and, uh, and that was it. it. It worked quite well for the rest of the mission. I think on about day four or five, we, we definitely knew that it was no longer an uncomfortable environment. It was warm, but certainly nothing that you couldn't put up with. Skylab, we're reading you loud and clear over the Vanguard for eight minutes. Of course, not having gotten the swing out on our first attempt when we came up there, we really had about uh, half of the electrical capability that we should have had. So it was very, very important to attempt to get that jammed solar panel out. I think we probably wouldn't have had any Skylab missions had it not been for the fact that man was able to get to the Skylab and to make it habitable and to repair it in such a way that all of the missions were completely successful. So uh, Joe tried and then we decided to tighten it up again and I'd try and I got under it and Boy, it broke. It, it let go in one big hurry, and there I was, launched into space again, free-floating, hanging on the end of this string. And, well, by the time I got straightened out again and looked around, why, there it was, out and deployed. Thus, very early, man's presence proved to be vital. And he'll start messing it up would be so in the missions that followed. At the proper time. But uh, in areas where you need man's flexibility and his initiative, for instance, uh, in the deployment of the solar wing on the first man mission and on the deployment of the sail that uh, was used to shade, provide thermal shading for the workshop on the second mission and on our mission where we had to reservice the coolant system or where we had to actually get out and unjam or move the filter wheel in the solar telescope cameras. That's where you need man. You need man up there when you need some freewheeling judgment and the tasks in space that uh, should be assigned to man are the tasks that require him to use his mind and his abilities, his unique abilities, which uh, certainly can't be covered by programming a computer. The reason for having a complete package of medical experiments on Skylab, as opposed to the case in the earlier missions where we did our medical stuff primarily before flight and then after flight, was that we were going to fly much longer than we ever had before. Uh, we were going to quadruple the amount of time spent by a human being in space from 14 days to 56 days. And as it turned out, we did better than that, 184 days on the third flight. The system we expected to change fastest in the body was the cardiovascular system, the heart, the blood vessels, the amount of blood in them and the way they operated. So our number one experiment to stress that system was called lower body negative pressure. Well, we didn't have gravity up there, so we couldn't stand up, and that lower body negative pressure is a substitute for gravity, a way to fake the body out. And we ran that at four-day intervals throughout the mission, and from the very first time we ran it, it was obvious that there were indeed changes. But the encouraging thing was that these symptoms were present the very first time we did the test, and they didn't get worse as time went on. There was another major dynamic test or stress test that we used 
uh, to determine our condition in flight, and that was the bicycle ergometer. And you simply worked your heart, your muscles, and your lungs to the maximum capacity to see whether they all played together the same way in the absence of gravity. We found that our ability to exercise, our heart's ability to move blood around the body, the cells and muscles' ability to extract oxygen from it, and all the processes that, that go into a maximum exercise were completely unaffected by zero gravity. It was also considered important to check the response of the vestibular system or the little balancing mechanism within the inner ear. And we did this by means of a rotating chair. Now normally when you sit in this chair and rotate on earth and move your head, it uh, doesn't take very long before you experience motion sickness. However, up there we noticed that after we were there a few days, it was possible to sit in this chair and rotate almost all day long with no sensation or motion sickness at all. We uh, took blood samples periodically throughout the flight, mainly to make sure that the hemoglobin level in the blood was maintained at a proper level and that the body was responding properly to lowered levels of hemoglobin or red blood cells to make sure that there was not some sort of subtle effect taking place in zero gravity that would leave us more or less open to uh, infection, say. On our mission, we uh, elected prior to the launch to increase the exercise period from an hour to an hour and a half. And this was done mainly on the basis of recommendations of the previous crew. They felt there just was not enough time for a good exercise period, that you really needed more time. We were also bringing up the little treadmill, which was going to require time for use, so we just ended up going for an hour and a half per day exercise. It appears that that decision was a good one because we came back, I think, in better condition than has any other crew. The Skylab medical experiments were perhaps one of the most important things we did uh, during the whole Skylab mission. We attempted to take a look at man as he reacted under long-term weightlessness. Whether or not we can extrapolate that uh, 84 days out to several hundred days, incidentally it takes something like 400 days for a typical Mars mission, uh, we don't know right now. But it does indicate that uh, we're on the right way to uh, uh, and assuming that man can exist for long times at zero-g. The sun turns out to be a giant astrophysical laboratory. It is made up of plasma, that's uh, high temperature gases which uh, we plan to use down here for many schemes in energy production. And we can use the sun as a laboratory to better understand how plasmas um, are affected by uh, electric and magnetic fields, uh, how they're moved, uh, what their properties are. <laughs> 